And so she came up to me one day. She said, Judith, do you realize what you've found? And I went, what do you mean? She said, you have found the rocket of spirituality. I want to learn from the person I know to li lives what they preach. You, you, the more you can forget yourself, the more you're there for other people. I, you know, I used to feel life was so bleak mm. and now life is magical, you know, and even beyond life is magical. Welcome to KanaCast, a series of conversations with residents and visitors to Kanha Shantivana, the International Heartfulness Center near Hyderabad, Telangana, India. In this episode, Emma Evaturi is speaking to Judith Nelson. Judith is a heartfulness trainer and also heartfulness coordinator for Europe. She has a background in physiotherapy and broadcasting and is a regular contributor to the Heartfulness magazine and to the website, The World Moms Network. Judith, it's really nice to meet you here in Kanha for the first time. I think we have been on a few conference calls together. Yeah, we have. And that's what I love about this place is that people from all over the world that you've seen or you know here and there, you come together. So this is your first time in how long? Actually, we haven't been for six years, which is probably the longest ever that I've not been in India. So it's been a long time coming. I'm so happy to be here. How has it been for you? So much has changed since you've come, I imagine. I think that was one of the nice things about leaving it six years, that the transformation is just unbelievable. And I think for me, what what it really felt like was, you know, if, if this can be established in six years, what is the hope for, you know, the rest of humanity? It was just like a, an incredible story of hope for me. So, yeah, it's been wonderful. And last time we were here, they, I think just the dorms, um, the comfort dorms had just be, been finished literally the day before and then coming back and looking at everything it's it's totally transformed were, totally you, transformed. were you here before any edifices were there yeah. and it was just yes yeah it was very 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 basic the meditation halls hadn't been built you know and there were no real sort of main you know there was I think maybe one main road or something so yeah it's 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 huge but it's also extraordinary because you know you can go places after six years and there's no change but yeah it just feels like this incredible amount of greenery has sprung up and just you know just it feels like a town but a really unusual town really lovely town you know so yeah a joy that's what I tell people when I tell them that I'm coming because we were married here, my husband and I, when it was just yeah. a road and a few edifices and mm. to see every year how much it changes, new buildings, taller plants. And what has been the highlight of your visit so far? Well, we were very, very fortunate that um, we went to have dinner with Daji, which was just lovely, actually. And we met some really lovely people there as well, some American ladies who were here um, to help publish Daji's latest oh, book. Some so, of the publishers. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So they're promoting the book and, and that, that was great as well. So I think that's the thing that not only did we have a lovely evening with Daji and he did a recording with one of them as well, an interview with one of them. Um, but we, we also got to meet people from, you know, the other side of the world as well. And that's the other beauty, isn't it, of Canada? You just, it's the UN, isn't it really? Everybody, everybody from all over the world can come and oh, it's just, it's so lovely that and way. You're yeah. from the UK yourself? Yeah, Scotland. Scotland. Okay. I have to say Scotland. Yeah, or I'll get into trouble with okay. my family. But yeah, yeah. We come from the UK, um, Scotland, live uh, north of Dundee. Um, but we've been living in Edinburgh for a long time as well. So most people will know Edinburgh because it's our capital. And you grew up in Scotland. Well, I had a very strange upbringing because I started life in, in England and then when I was... Because your accent is very It's strong. very neutral, yes. yeah. We, we moved to um, Canada. Mm. Um, and I had two years in Canada. Then we moved to Switzerland. And I had five years in Switzerland as a child. So I, I actually grew up speaking French um, as a oh. child. And then we moved to Scotland when I was 11. And I've been more or less there since just, yeah. 
So what was your life growing up in various countries and what was kind of the overall tone or the feeling of your family growing up? I think the the funny thing was I never felt at home anywhere because, you know, going from England to Canada, we were different mm. and felt a bit alien. And then going to Switzerland, we were even more different. And then going to Scotland after that, we were still different. We had different accents. We, we looked different. We felt different. Um, but it was a what was wonderful. And I, you know, I was so grateful for it. And later um, in my life, because, you know, it's so much easier to see things in hindsight. Um, I realized that I, I had lots of experiences as a child that many people don't get. Um, so I, I went to different schools. Um, the one in Switzerland in particular was an extraordinary school because it was a very, it, it was, it was very, um, very different. We were in school with people who were incredibly wealthy from, you know, backgrounds like um, Charlie Chaplin's wow. children went there, sort of film stars and people like that put their, their children in these schools. So we were mixing with people who were infinitely more wealthy than than we were but it it just it helped me to really realize quite a few things as a very young child as I say I was I left there at 11 and I remember having these thoughts of what is the point of this life even maybe around about seven eight mm. because it was so clear to me that um wealth didn't make you happy that was one thing the first thing that I I, I think I had this huge realization that they, all these people had so much money, but they weren't necessarily happy. And I watched their parents and I thought, they're not comfortable, they're not happy. So money doesn't, money isn't it. Money is not the, the source of your happiness. Mm -hmm. um, and I found, I, I found there was quite a lot of um, boundaries in Switzerland for me as well, <laughs> which I think... <laughs> Once I moved to Scotland, I felt the UK is a little bit more chaotic, and, okay. and um, yeah. it, it, so that was that was the quite druid. A, influence yeah, it, it was it was quite interesting because I, I felt a little bit unleashed then, you know, a bit freed up because yeah. we were in quite a, quite a quite a strict school okay. um, in Switzerland. It was you know very very sort of rule based because it was a, also a convent. Mm -hmm. So um, did you grow up with a Catholic background? Or? Yes, I started life um, as, as a Catholic. And, you know, I do, I admire people who can stay in Catholicism and grow. But for me, I always said to people, I think I needed meditation because I needed more help. Um, you know, I would admit that, that some people maybe can do it through those sorts of backgrounds, but it just didn't work for me because you know, I was looking for, I was wondering about what is the point of this life? I thought there's no point being here unless I'm going to understand it. And also I was a bit, probably a bit precocious. I used to ask some really hard questions know, of my parents. And uh, even, I mean, I'll, I'll go on to this in a minute, but I used to ask some questions and nobody could answer them. And I thought, well, what's the point in this if you can't answer my questions? And I also had this insight that I, I, f I felt like I was sitting in church going, you're getting it wrong. I mean, how, <laughs> how egocentric, hey, but you get, you get, you know, this is not surely what Christ was talking about. What he was talking about was be like me. Mm. Don't just follow me blindly, but become like me. We have, should aspire to, to, you know, rise up to, to, to be so much better. And I think that really, it really sank in and, and, and then when I moved back to Scotland, I had friends who were in different faith groups or whatever. And I, would, I was interested in going to see, what, what are you doing? Um, and uh, my best friend in, in Scotland, who I met when I was in college, she also had a very curious sort of nature. And she, she now meditates as well. She's, she's, she meditates in the heartfulness too. So we really hit it off and we were just so keen to, to explore. Um, but I would say I... I went all the way through my 20s before I, I really found what I was looking for. And in the meantime, I would think I was extremely challenging for a few people. Like when we, we were sharing this recently, when we were having marriage preparation and with the priest and he was sort of quizzing, you know, not quizzing, but asking questions and saying things. I was so 
probably so difficult for him. I, I, you know, I was challenging everything he said and like, you know, how can you tell me about marriage? You've never even been married. And, you know, just anything, Fair enough. <laughs> anything he said, I was challenging this poor man yeah. so much so that after two sessions, he said, it's okay, don't come back. <laughs> so I felt a bit bad after that but you know I, I just I think it was that sort of I want to learn from the person I know to li lives what they preach lives you know everything that I, I was looking for someone who could also really help me change you know I was aware that I, I, I couldn't do that myself I think that's that was what I gained mostly from my sort of early journey so yeah. at what point did you feel that the lack of resonance with what you were hearing was you've had enough and you were looking for something else? At what point was there that shift consciously? Um, I think I, I, what I did in my 20s, I looked for all the things which were supposed to make you happy. And I got all of them and I wasn't happy. Which so, things? Things like, you know, um, really lovely husband. He is a lovely husband. Um, money, you know, position. I I was worked as a broadcaster, and mm. once I started to be recognised, I actually I pulled back. I thought I don't like this, but I even had that. So you know, I I knew I, I everything I did didn't make me. It didn't fulfil me. It didn't it didn't make me happy. And then the 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 sort of pivotal moment was after having my first child. Mm because that was the next thing people were like oh you know maybe you, you should have kids which i left off for a long time um and even then i thought no as much as i loved my child it wasn't it just wasn't the thing that i was looking for and um you know you can't live through someone else mm -hmm. so that was the point at which i sort of really asked for uh, guidance and we we ended moving ended up moving abroad and for a little while we moved to the Basque country mm -hmm. and we went we went to a place called uh, Loyola which is where Saint Saint Ignatius um lived he was a he was a very famous warrior of his time and and, and very aristocratic man and he was very badly injured and while he was injured he was in bed and had to recuperate and at that while he was doing that, he was so frustrated, but he had the realization that the real, the real fight really is is actually with yourself. If you and fight is not a good word, but he, the real, you know, battle or to to be overcome, is the one of the self. Um, so we, we went and and I kind of had, we went to visit this place and and I had a real moment of enlightenment there just realize, sort of reading through his thing, it was like something happened. I, I can't d quite describe it, but it was like a real sense of enlightenment. That's okay, this is my path. This is my goal. I need to find a practice. So first of all, I think I was looking for a person, but then I realized, ah, practice is important. So when we went back to Scotland, um, I went to visit Mother Mira because my sister had been and to see her. And again, she said, well, come, you know, I think, I think you'll find this really good, really helpful. So I went asking for a practice of her. And when I had, I mean, it was an extraordinary experience. But um, when I came back to Scotland, I opened a book and I had, I found a leaflet that I'd picked up for what was you know heartfulness as was Sarge Marg at the time, and and I knew I thought this is for me, it's here, you know it's in Scotland because I I sort of loved um, Paramahansa Yogananda's books and I thought you know or maybe Kriya Yoga is right but I was kind of led to the practice as such, and when I when I'd gone to see Mother Mira I experienced quite a strange feeling in my head like a sort of a tingling or something. And as I drew up outside the trainer's house in Scotland, I got the same feeling in my head. And I thought, ah, oh, okay, this must be a sign. So that's when I, I started Heartfulness. So I was about 34 at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what do you feel like kind of checked the box for you? You said you were drawn to it. So how did you know that this was the thing for you? Well, 
it's quite funny how silly we are. And I put my hand up to that. I think I was in it for quite a few years before I, before I really realized, you know, um, I did start to change quite quickly. Um, but it was, I then had my son um, when I was, I'm trying to think, I'd probably have been, I might have started two or three years by that time. And I had to stop practice because I was so sick. I was so unwell all throughout the pregnancy. Um, but what I did instead was I used, I used the remembrance of the teacher at the time um, of, of Chariji, uh, who was the teacher of, of the time, to get me through this. And I felt hugely supported. So at that point, I didn't really, you know, I didn't question anything or think that, you know, I th still felt like I was very much in the right place. But when my son was born, I, I, I got some strange advice and I thought I couldn't meditate with him in the room and he was quite a restless baby. So I, I ended up stopping meditation for a while and being a bit, a bit sort of probably overtired, which you yes. will understand. Um, I, I started to question, well, is this the right path? If I, you know, if I can't do this, is it, you know, even though it was so interesting, the whole time I was pregnant, I realized afterwards, I actually kept moving despite, you know, not practicing it. There was definitely change. There was definitely growth, but I couldn't kind of put two and two together at that point, probably because I was so exhausted. Um, the second and, one changes things. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so it took. So I, 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 I stepped away f from the practice for a little while, for maybe a year and a half, and and then I started to keep meeting people, and I thought, oh, I think this is a sign, you know, to come back. And when I started up again, I, I just had this sense of right, this is it now. I'm, you know, I am absolutely clear about my my trajectory because I, I had a couple of experiences within that as well which were extraordinary and where I felt Charity's presence so strongly and so you so it was so helpful that I I, I came came back in and I don't know if you want me to tell you yeah. one of them but yeah. I went on a course and I went, I went to Wales actually on this course, three weeks away from the family, kind of quite entrenched in it. And the, this, the place, it was a really amazing place that we went to. It was like a, 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 a sort of a, a very old house, huge place. And the man who lived there had amassed a lot of literature. And I spotted, you know, what is Saj Marg in the bookcase? And all I wanted to do was read that and I thought, interesting and because the course was about sort of angels and ascension which suited a lot of people there but for me I realized it just wasn't I wasn't in the right place I was I was in the right place at the right time but it wasn't that path wasn't for me um, and I realized it when I asked the question of myself and of, of charity you know can I do both both of these things and I had this extraordinary dream. I thought I, I, I knew I had kind of couldn't do both because being a mum, it would have been very difficult. I had this extraordinary dream, which was that when I saw myself, when I saw myself doing one thing, it was like my head and, and my right hand had been cut off. Wow. And then when I saw myself doing Saj Margo heartfulness, I was whole. And it was, it was this extraordinary realization. As soon as I had that realization that that's my path, I felt, I felt a sense of calm and clarity. Um, and when I, by, when I came home, I finished the course because I thought I, I only had three days to go. And I thought, I'll just finish it. But I came home with a different perception, trajectory. And it was as if from that point on, nothing was going to get in my way. Nothing and no one. <laughs> Strong willpower. It was like everybody can part the ways, you know, no matter who stepped in my way after that. It's like, no, I know where I'm going and I know who I'm following and I'll be following them. You can come out of my life as far as I'm concerned before I will stop following them. So, so that was kind of, yeah, I think that was the pivotal moment though. Mm -hmm. And had you been to India at that point or that was afterwards? No, that interestingly, I hadn't. So after that, 
um, that I went to, to India for the first time. I had met Chari. I'd Cleared met him come. in Scotland okay. in Broomley. Um, and I wonder, no, I think I think I'd only met him in Broomley actually. And, and even that, that was, you know, you, you've you've met the teachers, and it can be quite a, a an extraordinary. Um, How meeting. was it for you? It was when he left. I felt utterly bereft. I, I couldn't believe it. I thought, what is this? I don't really know this man, but I was so upset. It was like, you know, and it, I, 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 I realized I'd made a connection that I didn't even understand. Um, but I came to India for the first, well, I came, I'd come as a, a in my 20s, um, just, just a tour, really. Um, but I came to see him in particular, Charity, um, for the first time, I think when I was, it must have been about 40, actually, at that time, and went to Chennai and got to tour with him as well. And it, I mean, I had three weeks and it was absolutely extraordinary. I mean, just out of this world, the difference in, in coming here to even, you know, meeting the teachers in your own home space, you know, just the experiences that you have. Mm. And that was, that was a really funny story because I, I thought, oh, he, he's, you know, he said he was going to be touring and I thought, great, I'm going to tour. I'll see a bit more of India. That was my thought, yeah, see a bit more of India. And we went to exactly the same places as I had been the first time I came and I felt I felt a bit cheated I was like I've done that <laughs> could we not go somewhere else you know excuse me <laughs> yeah but yeah oh, it was it was magical yeah. it was it was really magical actually because it it was just it, it it was just sort of learning so much from the inside and and being able to see so much more on the inside than than ever before so yeah so in the spiritual anatomy book you were yeah. talking about earlier, um, the inside is mapped out by the 13 points or the 13 yeah. chakras. So um, do you feel like you could correlate any of those experiences to the, the, the points or is there something that stands out from that trip or another time? It, yes. It, it, interestingly, um, I think I was living in Edinburgh when after when Charity came and I think I was moved from point one to point two and I had this hilarious experience actually um I felt a lot calmer I felt like you know like everything just felt so much easier and calmer and just at one with with everything but I I also had a very pivotal moment I was sitting as you do in a hot tub in a spa in Edinburgh on the rooftop of a hotel. And I just had this extraordinary moment where I just thought, I love everyone. And also just like I'm co-creating with God. That's, you know, that's what my life is about now. And, you know, experiences are interesting and fine. And just this moment of ah oh, bliss, you know, um, which of course they never last. <laughs> changes and it shifts but I think that 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 was definitely something that I could in, as, especially in hindsight I, I can map out oh okay that was that was that and that was that was before before I went to India um and before I sort of had yeah other kind of experiences that I would now relate very clearly to going through certain points as well because I was navigating from Babaji's works, Babaji's books, and I loved to read the read the point about the points and what they all meant and the experiences. Because I was really curious and nosy, and I didn't want to miss out. You know, I didn't want to be ignorant. Um, so I was constantly sort of trying to map out. Well, I, I'm feeling like this. What, what does that relate to? Um, and where, where where might it be? So, yeah, so the, the Yatra Garden is, I mean, another experience on top of that, of course, and Daji's new book is even clearer. So I, I would say that it took hindsight for me to understand. Uh, you know, I maybe wasn't very aware of what was, was happening until I had an experience of going, I think, from 0.5 to 6. And that was after 
after after coming to India and we had the great blessing of Charity came to stay at our house for one night in the UK. Um, and the, the, the experience I had going from point five to six, which is leaving the heart region to moving into the mind region was much clearer, much, much clearer. So yeah, that was, that was, that was very interesting. Can you feel that you, a differentiation between the experience of the heart region and the experience of shifting into the mind region? Oh, it's vast. It's vast. It's like, how to put it? So in the heart region, everything feels quite hard. I, I call it, you know, like wading through treacle a little bit, you know, and, and, and everything feels personal. Mm. So it's like, it's all happening to me. And then when you, when you're brought through, you know, to, to the, the, the next stage where you're taken a, a little bit above, it's like looking down from the mountaintop and everything feels much less sort of much less um, physical, much less emotional, and much more, much more subtle, much more beautiful as well. It just, you know, and we, we're always going, th you know what it's like, we're always going, I, I sort of liken it to a spiral, which is moving. So we, we sort of hit different experiences and we're always moving forwards, hopefully. Um, but the, the sense of it, 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 it depersonalizes. It's like transcending something uh, which feels much more heavy and and you you you, you feel a, a level of detachment which you didn't have before and and it's i mean it's it's a gift it's it's given uh, you know i i've heard some people when they start they're they're concerned about detachment they're afraid yeah, that yeah. you know i like my life the way it is i like my career mm -hmm. i don't want that so how would you explain to somebody what that kind of detachment is like yeah, I, I had the same sort of questions, but um, I was, I just thought, well, oh, I want to try it. And I, I looked at the masters or the teachers, you know, they're living a life. They're not, you know, unable to function. So I thought it must be okay. Cause that was always my, that's always been my reference point is look at, look at them, look at what they're like, what they're doing and take your cue from that. Uh, so. I was, I thought, feel, it seems okay. So, yeah, it, it, somebody else said this to me. It's an ego thing. You know, it's like, it's the change of, of, our, of our awareness, of our perception. Um, I haven't lost who I am in any way. I, I've just, in fact, really found who I am in, in a much more beautiful way. Because... One of the reasons I started in the first place was I really didn't like who I was. I, I, you know, I just was so unhappy with myself. And the thought that I, this, I was going to just sort of ossify or this was it. And not feeling complete, not feeling comfortable in my own skin. And, you know, to, to when you, you progressively lose your, your sort of ego... It's so much easier. It's so much better. There's just nothing like it. And and that was something that really struck me was when I heard Charity. Somebody said to Charity, um, how can I help you one day? And he said, forget yourself. And that went right in. And I thought, okay, that's that's really important. And it's not like you don't have an identity. You know who you are. And, but it shifts from being this focused on the outs, outer stuff to a real centeredness where you know yourself, you know what feels right for you, you, you don't have doubt or very little, you know. So that's the shift is from this very much more ego-based identity to, um, to a soul-based identity or spirit-based identity for people who maybe don't believe they have a soul. It's... It's something just so much more subtle, so much connect, more connected to everything else. And you, you, the more you can forget yourself, the more you're there for other people. The, you know, the less triggers you, you know? It's just, well, you do know because you're on that journey too. It's a journey <laughs> and it is touching yeah. all the points as you go forward, yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, because the thing is, I, uh, early on again, I, I was I was studying Babaji, Babaji's um, commentaries as well on 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 uh, what do we feel even going through a point to understand it. So you know, there's that that shift from. We, we we come in and it feels a bit like oh this is really hard. You feel like you've gone back to the the start, and you've got to be careful because it's that feeling of being pulled back can make you discouraged and feel like dropping off. But actually, I you know I always, t always tell people this is a good sign. It means we're moving. We're not stagnating in that, and actually you're just on the next step up of the ladder. Well, whatever that may be, a point, a sub point, whatever. Um, you just got to keep going. So I, I liken it to, uh, you know, I see it happening to me even once a month, once a week, whatever. It just feels like things are just a little bit harder. And then you have your I am God moment. <laughs> I used to, I used to dread that because I would, oh, I mean, my husband would even say, bit of an I am God moment, <laughs> <laughs> Judith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'd be, I'm right, I'm, you know, I'm all powerful. <laughs> sure, this is great. And then that transfers, transforms as well into, you know, um, all is God. And then you go into all from God. Mm. And then... Um, you move into this, into this sort of. I liken it to again, you know, bit, you know, negation where you you're getting churned up and 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 it's almost like you know you're having to divest yourself of the stuff that's holding you back to then merge at that point. So I was really interested in, in these things, and I I can see it each time you go through the next cycle, you, you can become observant and ask for help. It's just, I just asked for insight. I asked for, for, yeah, for, for sort of understanding, and it would come. So I realized as well. I equated that with the, you know, in the Bible, ask and you shall receive. That was the that was the thing to ask for, you know, is understanding, not money, not all these other material pieces of nonsense, which of course are essential, but you know, if on a spiritual journey, you just need enough. Um, so that was the thing that that I found so extraordinary and, and and joyful, joyful. I mean, good grief. We don't need to be miserable on this journey. You know, there's just so much fun and joy you can have by tuning into yourself and laughing at yourself as well. <laughs> just, just I, I watch myself over the years do some really stupid things. But then I go, ah, it's all right. You know, you're a child. Don't worry about it. Each day is a new day. Brush it off. Start again. Move forward. You know, yeah. don't don't have the guilt, which was what I was brought up with. Yeah, I yeah. definitely can resonate with that. I I have a tendency to be a bit by the books and a bit straight laced, and then mm -hmm. and then internalizing that as well. So mm -hmm. I I resonate as well with this feeling that this whole path is such an adventure yeah. Uh, yeah you know i grew up in the area era of harry potter which is this magical mystical fabulous <laughs> but i feel that heartfulness is like if harry potter were real life i mean obviously we're not wizards and things like that it's not about in incanting magic it's more that there's this kind of things that are really reality that from mm -hmm. one standpoint seem fantastic, the more that you experience what you're saying, this clearing away of things or these uh, little catalysts in having a profound experience, it's actually just you opening up to what's really there. But from where you were before, it's almost magical. And it's so fun. Mm -hmm. But then the trick, like you were saying, is that, oh, it's this I am God moment. Then the ego creeps in. Because, oh, I've gotten to such and such a place. And um, I think sometimes when we're having these kinds of dialogues, people who haven't had that experience or are, or, or, or when uh, you're, you're a trainer as well, mm -hmm. when you start a new, uh, a new meditator, I feel sometimes people want to say what their experience was afterwards. And, oh, I saw these colors or yeah. there's this. And I, I think I had that when I started this desire to have a certain kind of experience. Mm -hmm. So what would you speak to that about just letting things unfold on their own and from what your experience was? Yeah. Um, 
I, I mean, I started off, I think I was really quite ignorant to start with, uh, with the whole thing. And what I did was I watched how my life changed and how I changed because I didn't have particularly great experiences in, in meditation or anything like that. I mean, I, mine often came in strange moments. It wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, I, I was in meditation to enjoy the meditation, to be honest. I just recognized that the meditation was necessary to help me manage my thoughts and manage myself and manage my, watch myself, to observe myself, because it's important or helpful anyway to to be able to observe yourself in a in a in a kind way. Um, so, I, I it, it's difficult to think back, you know, because it's quite a long time since mm. I, I started out. But, um, yeah, I I wasn't. I had a bit of. I, I had other people had amazing experiences in meditation. It would ex, it, you know I would hear them. I think. I've got sort of meditation envy or, you know, experience envy here. But then I, I would rein myself in and go, but you feel you feel better. That's what matters. It's not about the experience. It's about what is it doing for you in your life? And I think going through pregnancy and um, being, having to learn to, having to learn to, to connect all the way through, like what we call constant remembrance, was really set up for me at that time. And I realized as well through so many of my experiences that what I was being given was a gift, really. It's, you know, I could do my practice and everything, but the, the real help was coming from the teacher or teachers, as I've had two now. And that was, that was extraordinary. I, you know, because I, 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 I was, I kept on changing even when I didn't practice. So what, you know, what is the conclusion? The conclusion is you take one step forward, they take a hundred towards you kind of thing, you know? I mean, that's so humbling, so humbling because the biggest trap for me in the whole spiritual journey is to be self-involved. You know, the self-forgetfulness in a healthy way. And I mean, let it develop naturally, you know, ask for it if you truly want it and it will come. It, they will give that, but getting hung up on experiences isn't necessarily, to my mind, a good thing because whatever we have, whatever is there, it can be attachment and any attachment, whether it be the practice, the outer form of the teacher, whatever, is a trap. So, you know, the, the, and, and I'm not meaning that in a heavy way, but it's just like, you know, nobody traps us but ourselves. So we we are the we are the you know experiment with the experimenter as well like Daji said, and the joy in it for me is is becoming childlike and and you know an innocent it's that innocence that we can develop through letting go of our stuff the heaviness the preconceptions the judgments the you know it goes on and on and on the the indoctrination the you know, the cultish thing of religion, um, other people's views of you. Oh, let it go. It's just, as you say, magical. It's miraculous. Because once you can get to that place where you actually don't care who thinks what of you, yeah. they have no effect on you. You are the one, you know, that that can determine your destiny as well, like Daji said. The freedom is just not just magical, miraculous, Harry Potter. -ish. <laughs> I love Harry Potter. Um, it's just like it. It's just beyond comprehension, and we all have to realize it for ourselves. You know, there's no, nothing I can say to anyone else that's going to persuade them. Why would they believe me? But it's. I think it's. You know, we begin to see it in other people. We begin to see that inner joy of discovery. And going on the, the fairground ride, you know, <laughs> which I love. If I, after this, we're going to Japan and there's a Harry Potter ride oh. I have booked for. <laughs> and I mean it. It's like, yo. Um, so, yeah, it's just, I, you know, I used to feel life was so bleak. Mm. And now life is magical, you know, and even beyond life is magical. It's like what? What's to come is an adventure that's just the next adventure. So, you know, that those fears that we have, those fears of separation, the fears of dying and all these sorts of things, they can go 
um, you know, this this whole practice is just, it's just, I just feel so happy that I was, it was like I was found. It wasn't even, you know, I, I, I you, you kind of find it when you're ready. Mm -hmm. And then like me, you can drop off for a while, but hopefully you, you, you realize, oh, it's still going on. I still have that link. And you come back and you come back brighter, stronger, and more determined. So even, you know, even, even if people have breaks, I am always consoling, go, don't worry about it, it's fine. You trust how you feel, trust what you're doing. And I'm always at the end of the phone, you don't worry about it. You let people go their way and you wait. And you know, they're always there, they're always gonna come. What were some of those things you felt dropped off for you? Oh gosh, so many, <laughs> so many. Um, I, I, I suppose in the earlier stages, the need to be seen, the need to achieve, um, you know, according to the world, it's hard. I, you know, I know for people as we grow up in our teens, in our twenties, there's so we have so many expectations of ourselves, um, and 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 I think that really dropped off. Um, the, yeah, the, I, I think the, the feeling of, of not having found what I was looking for, when that went, oh my Lord, it was just, that was so precious, that, that realization of, okay, yeah, this is it, this is it. And, you know, you're doing all of that while being in a normal life. It's not, you, you don't have to leave anything. In fact, everything you have around you is your teacher. Yes. as hard as it may be and and that sort of realization that the hardest lessons are the best lessons so letting go of the of the feeling of pain of learning you know and the the shift from i think that's a real heart to mind region shift is that sort of the realization that you don't it doesn't have to be suffering it may start as suffering but it becomes opportunity, that shift from, yeah, that lovely sort of, sort of going from, oh, I feel this feels so tough, this feels so hard, and which is perfectly natural, perfectly normal. It shifts into, ah, okay, that, I, that felt uncomfortable. What am I to learn from this? You know, that's, that was just superb. And the, yeah. the difficulty can coexist with the acceptance. Yes, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. That, again, that's back to trying to be observant and, and not to be, um, not, not to sort of be hard on yourself about it. To remember at each moment, love yourself in this journey. Give yourself a bit of love. How, you know, how would you treat someone else in, in that position? You would be kind to them, hopefully, you know, as, tra as a trainer, we would hopefully be kind to them. And, and just as soon as you can bring in love into the picture, the ego drops off, the blame drops off, the guilt drops off. And you, for me, I felt like the more I've realized of the journey, the more grateful I am to our teachers that they can help us cross these stages. I mean, I don't know where I'm going, so I need that guidance. I need that person who's been there, done that, to prompt, to push, to, to cajole or whatever. Um, and I, the, the duty I have is to cooperate and to do my best to be grateful, to never forget who gave me what I, what as you know, what I have now, um, that's really important because otherwise we spoil the work they've done, you know. It's like, like the, you know, you've got the best teacher ever and if you don't listen to them or try to cooperate with them, then it's a bit unfair, yeah, yeah a bit unfair. And I think as a Catholic, that was helpful. You know, being brought up to, to th in a religion helped me to have a sense of, of, of someone who, who was out there who was helping, you know, whether it be angels, whether it be uh, the Christ essence, I don't, I, I don't know, but um, yeah, I think, I think that was helpful. It removes, it removes you from the picture. Anything that can remove you from within this whole thing 
is it makes you feel lighter. It help it helps a lot. I definitely feel coming from a Judeo Christian background as well <laughs> that mm. there was um, a shift in understanding what a guru really was, what a guide really was. I feel that there's, a, I mean, understandably and probably with a grain of salt, a lot of skepticism around following somebody because yeah. we've seen so yes. many examples yeah. where it's yep. been to people's detriment and I think mm. we should approach it with caution. But, um, I, you know, what was your experience when you started meditation and then finding out, oh, there's this guide and what is his role and mm. how do you relate to him? Um, I was a bit nonplussed at first. I think, you know, I, I was told to go and have a, go and sit with Chariji. I thought, okay, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> it's fine. And I'd say it was when he left at that point that I, I suddenly realized, goodness me, there's some, something's happened here. Um, but I, yeah, I, I kind of, I realized that there's no push from their side, none. They're, they're giving, 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 giving all the time. Incredible. And I had this, another epiphany going, well, if, if I want to be like that, I've let, I've got to allow them to, to help me change and allow them to every aspect of my life. They can't be brackets. You know, it's like, you know, church on a Sunday, you know, you behave for half an hour and then you leave and you start <laughs> messing about as soon as you've gone. Um, I, I thought, yeah, I've got, I've even got to invite them and be willing for them to, to, yeah, to, to come into every experience of my life. So I actually did, after visiting India for the first time, I invited Chariji. I couldn't believe it when he came. I mean, he said, yes, I'm coming, because we lived near Glastonbury in England at that point. And he, he wanted, to, he, it was on his sort of list of things to do to, to come to Glastonbury. So so he came, and, and that was in itself just, I mean, incredible that this man would come to, you know, to my own home um it was it was scary at first but it was just brilliant you know what what happened in that time was just so precious so precious i mean and it wasn't even anything particularly esoteric but it was watching him uh, uh, you know close up and seeing what he was doing and giving and i i would have been a total cretin to have doubted after that really and truly you know, my experiences of of being close to him were were such that I, I would have had to be a complete idiot if I'd not believed in this person. And I, I don't think everybody has to do that. But you, you know, look at look at what they're giving, look at what they're doing, and see. You know, try to put your own prejudices aside and fears aside, and then you begin to realize. All the things are giving, and even even the tough stuff. I've you know I've had some tough experiences. I had a couple of tough experiences with Chari, and it was hard. But I realised again in hindsight, you've got to wait. You've got to let it percolate. What's what's going on here? And for me, I, I had very I had a really strong ego. I mean. St powerful anything I thought I could do I would do you know it's like no I'm, I don't men what are they you know but I'm, I'm I didn't even identify particularly as being female because I had three sisters so it's like that's not a man's job but I can do that if they can do that I can do that you know so even the, the idea that the the masters or teachers and a man never stopped me from thinking I can do this um because I think that's what a lot of people get in their way is like if you believe it's not possible it won't be possible you know the power of the mind it'll it'll happen for you but if you believe the opposite it will also happen for you mm. so I I didn't get caught up in too much I think of the I know people find it difficult you know the, the present teachers male and so on and so forth Oh, yeah, right. whatever. I just meant more the sense yeah. of uh, having a guru. Yes, yeah, absolutely. But also that this this idea of having the guru, um, I, it, it to me, it's any teacher's necessary. Mm. I don't know how to drive a car before, you know, somebody teaches me. So it's the same on the spiritual journey for me. It's just like or personal transformation. 
you need a teacher to help you. Mm. That that was it. So so yeah, I, I I've always felt it was utterly essential. Actually, I it's great if you can do without it. Congratulations, but that wasn't my lot. <laughs> oh no, I absolutely needed the teacher, and I needed somebody who would help me get past myself and my ego. I think I didn't realize that that's what I was doing, that I kept looking for someone and I kept looking at different people and no one kind of lived up to it until yeah. I found heartfulness. I wonder, you mentioned that Charji came to where you lived because it was kind of on his checklist. And it's, I think it's funny that when you went to India first to travel with him, you didn't get to any of the places on your checklist, but then it was inverted that when you happened to invite him, it was some place he intended to go anyway. So, yeah, I never thought about it yeah. like that. That's a lovely thought, actually. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. what about? So, you're saying having him there and observing him, you felt like it was just so obvious to to be um, to admire this person or to just see him as he was. So, for someone who wasn't there, what are the things that you observed that helped you come to that realization or just matter of fact experience? I think it's a selflessness. It was just working all the time and, and being with people and the real kindness. Now, you know, we're all, the teachers have to sometimes, they give us what we need if we're open to it, not what we want. So that can come in different guises. So, you know, you might have an experience with them which is utterly beautiful. And then the next time that, you know, you might get rubbed up a little bit with something that you need to let go of, but you're clinging on to. Mm. And, and I had that experience at one point that obviously I think my ego was very much in the way and, and needed, I needed a little bit more work is a good way to put it. Um, and, you know, my, the experience I've had with Daji has been always been utterly lovely. Actually, I, I had, I ended up with having lunch with him one time when we were in, in Montpellier and um, he was so considerate and so kind and it you know, picked up on so much at, at the time. So I think that's what really impressed me as well is their ability to, to feel what people need. You know, it's that, I mean, how extraordinary is that to not have any focus on the self, but just to be really present to the people around you. It's, it's lovely and to the, feel that calm that they have, that calm that you can usually feel in being in their presence. But at the same time, the practice gives us that too. You know, it really does if we can engage with it enough, it, it brings the qualities that the teachers have right into us. So, you know, even if we don't meet them, we can transform just as easily because that's, you know, the practice is then. It doesn't matter whether you believe in the teacher, you believe in God, you don't have to believe it a thing, you know. You can still change because it's, it's a practice. It doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care what you believe or not. So, so that's, that's the beauty. And it's, you know, of course, that's via transmission. Transmission doesn't discriminate. Um, in terms of somebody's a Muslim, somebody's a Christian, who cares, you do. So, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a, you know, this whole thing, isn't it? It's a long journey of realization. Realization is never really fixed for me. It's like unfolding. So that's the other beauty and excitement of the journey is that constant learning the new, the next thing, that awakening to, oh, right. Oh, I didn't notice that before, or I see that now. Um, yeah, and, and just following in the footsteps of the people who've gone in before you. So we're not, we're not slaves. We're not blindly following someone. We are being given, constantly being given the understanding, the realization of what they have gained before us. I mean, it just I see it as a long line of you know people constantly evolving and or you know a great big sort of I always have this picture I always used to picture people sort of all coming following together kind of thing and and there's there's in some ways it's bizarre as well it feels like there's no higher or lower there's just awakening to it you know we're just we're going from 
not yeah, Babaji, I think he said, you know, there was not much difference between the way that you start and the way that you finish, but that difference is everything kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? It's just, you're still you. You're still, you're still the same person in so many ways. You've still got that same identity, but you're just, you're just transformed in, 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 your, in your view of it all, almost. Yeah. Because I think people do worry about what's going to happen to me and, uh, you know, don't worry. Oh goodness me! It's so much better. You yeah, know? and I, I, I'm not. I am not truly transformed. I'm on the journey, like yes. everyone else. You know, I've, I, and I, I just, I suppose I'm just, yeah, more and more grateful, and and also I realize more and more how much more help you need. The further you go forward, mm -hmm. the more help you need. Actually, it's, it's a sort of a paradox, an infatendo, as Charity used to say, and I used to. I feel like it was going to break my head to try and understand what, what does he mean. You know? yeah, 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 funny. Brilliant. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about a, a funny experience I had. And, and I, I did feel a little bit slow and dense after this experience because I thought to myself, oh, geez, you know, it, it's just funny how, how, how other people can sort of make you so aware of something that you've maybe missed. So I introduced a friend to heartfulness and she is highly sensitive. She's one of these people who, she did Bach flowers and understood everything about it. She was, you know, she's very intuitive. And um, she, she'd been doing a different practice. And I finally asked her, why don't, why don't you try this one I'm doing? And so she came up to me one day, she said, Judith, do you realize what you've found? And I went, what do you mean? She said, you have found the rocket of spirituality. She said, I said, what are you talking about? She said, you know how like most of us are going on a bike or maybe on a train? She said, this is spiritual rocket fuel, okay? We are on a rocket in Saj Marg as it was at the time. And I thought, you know, and, and it sort of, it, it dawned on me and I went, oh my goodness, you're so right. You're so right. I just, I hadn't realized it. And she had, and, and you know, there's a lovely lesson in this that she was literally just started and her, her vision, her insight was greater than mine. And, and I've, I've found this as I've gone along as well. It, it's absolutely irrelevant to how long we've been meditating for. Yes. People come when they're ready and some of them are way more ready than I was when I started. And that's the beauty, I think. It's, again, that invitendo. People often think, oh, you've been meditating forever. You must be this or that. You can have someone walking in the door and they're, they're, they're already ahead of you. And, and that was so funny. You know, I just, I actually laughed about it afterwards because I, I, I was so grateful to her because she helped me really realize what, what it was that I'd found in this. Because she, she, she had done a lot of meditation and she, she recognized, she felt transmission and went, wow, what is this? And she, she did Reiki and things like that. So she was used to working with energy. Mm. And I was going along quite oblivious, you know? I was like, oh, this is nice practice. Oh, this is lovely. Um, I hadn't quite sort of engaged with it. So for me, there, was, there, was, there were always like a series of little events that would help me to understand things and and that's why i'm always saying you know we need to be we need to be patient i think with ourselves as well and kind to ourselves and and look back at well what was that about and because in the moment we often do miss things we oh, really do undoubtedly more yeah. than we can conceive of <laughs> more, more, and in my case it was over many years yeah i missed the yeah. point <laughs> but but i i you know i had enough insight to to realize that I needed to keep going because it was changing me. But it was, you know, these moments happen when someone else comes and tells you, by the way, tap, tap, tap. <laughs> you know, what planet are you on that you didn't realize? Or like, oh, no. or like what yeah. you were saying about when you have an experience and you're not quite sure what it is and then yeah. you write it down and yeah. forget about it, as they yeah. say. And then, you know, however long later, you realize, oh, that's what was happening, whether it was yes. correlated with a point or some condition or something. That yeah. sometimes you need a little space, a little distance 
before you really integrate or understand what it is. Yeah, I've always likened it to you can have the realization of something and it's a, it's a knowledge based yes. thing, you know, or you get a tiny little experience of it, but then you have to wait for it to percolate and eventually you become it. So you, you, you will have an insight which is really helpful and then you forget it and you're like, what, what was that? What was that? And I trust now that the, 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 the sort of the view, vision of it comes first then it percolates, percolates. And you just have to try to catch it in that moment and go, okay, I'd like to understand more of that. And then it will percolate and eventually it becomes not just your experience, but your way of being. So it's that sort of, per it's like a coffee percolator. You put the coffee in at the top and wait till it percolates. So the coffee's like, you know, the, the experience that you have just in a moment, you might catch something, could be walking around or anytime. And then bit by bit, you drink it and it sinks in kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was so lovely connecting with you and knowing a little bit more about your journey. Oh, um, thank you. I hope you enjoyed yeah. the last few hours of your visit here. Yeah. yeah. And um, we'll see you next time we converge in this place again or on a conference call. <laughs> oh, thanks, Emma. Yeah, I look forward to it always. All yeah. right. Safe journey and until then. Thank you. Very good to be here. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of KanaCast. Do subscribe to KanaCast on YouTube, Instagram and Spotify. Until the next episode from the entire KanaCast team. Namaste and goodbye.